evening meditation, I suggest we turn to Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 2. Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, and let us meditate on what he has written here in the knowledge of what we already have. Just think how many months have gone by as we have looked, on the one hand, at the great package of the mystery, which has been revealed to us as a wonder filled with wonders. And then we've looked at a number of the detail wonders. And so, with that in mind, uh, we go on with his teaching in Colossians 2, 1, 4. I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Again, I would say that an inquirer might ask, what is the mystery of God? And I think you'll have to tell him that it is fully revealed in the epistles if he'll only only read them as for a starter. Would that ye knew what great conflict, Paul writes, I have for you. The word translated conflict is the Greek from which we get to the word agony. Agony. As that of a tortured soul. He's so concerned. He knows that the only way for believers to be established in the faith is to be well acquainted with the revelation of the mystery and the glorious dispensation in which we are living at the present time and to be occupied with the head, even the Lord Jesus. And when a man writes like this, dedicated unto the Lord, filled with the Spirit, sharing with the believers, I want you to know the agony of my soul in this particular matter. People who are ignorant of what God has revealed concerning this dispensation in which you and I live cannot realize I do not believe that they can realize the intensity of the apostles feelings when seeing the truth being denied if people have no concept of the reality they're not going to be concerned very much when they see people dabbling in that which is fanciful. But he knew. God had revealed to him the mystery. He tells us that God revealed it also to the, holy, the other holy apostles and, and prophets. But there was a personal visitation and revelation given to the apostle Paul. That before the beginning of time, God had conceived in his wisdom and in his love to create a new humanity in Christ Jesus. And this came about at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon that company of believers, Jews and proselytes. But they didn't know really what had happened more than that at least a part of the Old Testament prophecy concerning the uh, 
dispensation of the Holy Spirit had, had taken place. It took a while as the believers fellowshiped together as they read in the Old Testament, because that was the only uh, Bible that they had, before the revelation was really well known, that this was a new thing. This was no accident of history. This was something that God had planned way back in the beginning of time. It's been revealed as we mentioned this morning, you have it in these epistles. And yet, you understand why people don't read the epistles? Because uh, somehow they have an idea that this is beyond them or unnecessary. I was reading in a book the other day, one that I still have, but I feel as though it ought to be thrown away. Where a man had written, I don't know how many pages, I think it's around 600, so I've got some distance to go. And he has no concept whatever of dispensations. Or that the time in which we live is different from any other time. None whatsoever. And it's sad, because he's a man of a following, and has many people paying attention to him. In fact, someone was so charmed by what that man wrote that the individual gave me that book as a gift, thinking that this would elevate me considerably. But it depressed me. And we'll see the reason why. Any pastor whose academic background has not been marred, has not marred his vision of God's revelation, is deeply disturbed when recognizing the dangers to Christians who lend ear to those who oppose dispensational truth. When in conference a month or so ago, about a month ago now, as they, in that conference in North Andover, the question was asked of us who are on the panel, and I hadn't anticipated that question. But the question was asked, why is it that dispensational teaching is so hated? And it is. And I wasn't as aware of it uh, as probably I should have been. But talking with some of the brethren afterwards and those who are well informed, it's very evident that uh, there is a hatred there. And it's a remarkable thing, and I think I can explain it now. This agony of the soul is intense because such a departure is a dishonor to the Lord Jesus Christ who he really is and what he wants and intends to be in the life of every believer not to understand that God has revealed something new that had never been on the earth before and that's the real Christianity as Peter says that it's the present truth the faith once delivered to the saints, writes Jude. What a marvelous thing that God is doing. And yet so many people call themselves Christians and they do not see it. Today, as I learn from the brethren, there comes from graduate students a vehement attack against Bible teaching pastors who insist that the mystery so clearly revealed in the written word of God is the true Christian faith. And we're called ignorant. 
I, I wasn't aware of what some of the things we were called until the fellows told me. But I can believe that it's happened, and having read some of it myself. And we go on in our reading of his concern, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, his concern was for all the believers, not just the folks in Colossae. Every assembly, and the many who had never met him in person. So I guess that brings us in too, doesn't it? That this, that their hearts, in verse 2, might be comforted. Sam was leading us in the matter of, of uh, boldness and taking God at his word and standing up. That word comforted means really to make brave and to be encouraged. That their hearts might be made brave and encouraged. Comforted is the word here. Being knit together in love. And he knows the only thing that will do it is the knowledge of the mystery. Only the truth really comforts in this sense. Truth unites, but error divides. You could try this. I'm sure it would work out that way. Let's say Mr. A starts reading the scripture. Just reading. Um, he's just reading it. And then we'll say we'll get Mr. B to read the word separately apart now Mr. A reads the word unmolested no no nothing coming in there Mr. B reads the word unmolested nothing coming in there and they'll both come out with the same conviction Taking God at his word is one of the most important things you can do. And not to take him at his word is a most serious offense to God. People have read the Bible independently of one another without interference from somewhere else and they come to the same conclusion. And down through the years where men have stepped out from among the, the common and the herd and have called attention to dispensational truth that there is a distinction and there are distinctives in God's wonderful word in most cases have not depended upon what somebody else wrote in a previous generation because just reading the word with somebody without somebody else getting involved in it where else can they come out but the same way there's a, a story told I think it was uh, I'm not so sure but it, I think it was uh, uh, who was it uh, a brother who was here some time ago um, I've forgotten his name now for the moment he tells a story and he himself was black and uh, he said the story is, 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 is somebody said that if a, if a black man comes out of the south and and he's not a Baptist and, and he's a, an Episcopalian you realize that somebody has monkeyed with his religion <laughs> uh, Leonard Lane <laughs> I think he was the one that shared that with me. If people will be left alone, just go by the word. Sometimes we have to shut out these other things. They'll come out the same way. 
and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. This is the design and this is why. Paul told them to share this epistle with those in Thessalonica. You find that in verse uh, in chapter 4. And why earlier in his ministry he had written to the assembly in Thessalonica. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. He wants it to get out and, and he wants all of the believers to know in this assembly and that assembly because there's only one true Christianity and that is that which God has revealed since the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. To the acknowledgement, that is literally to the knowledge of the mystery. Here is personal conviction, acknowledgement, affirmation, application, being a part of it, and being established unto all the riches in Christ. You see, ignorance of the mystery is the path to confusion. And there is so much confusion in America today, we don't have to go to some other country to find it. I'm not talking about cults, but I'm talking about the many followings that we have in America today. Because of the uh, invention of radio, television, and uh, such media where people are able to reach so many. And people are deceived because there's only one truth. There's only one Christianity. And we ought to know it. And, and it's written. But you see, people stay away from it. And the reason that people do not read the epistles, one of them, is that it exposes what we are. When you read, for example, Christ in you, the hope of glory, you know whether it's so or not. He wrote, examine your own selves. Know ye not your own selves. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that Christ is in you? You see, a people can go along and call themselves Christians, memorize Bible verses, sing gospel songs, and yet not have life. How serious it is. Because this is a new thing. This is a new humanity. This is the life of God in the individual. Not because we feel that way, but because he said it that way. And it does make a difference, as we heard last Sunday evening. And when people go off from this, there's only one way they'll go. And that's to increase the confusion in the ranks of those who call themselves Christians. I think one of the first things we need to know about a missionary candidate or... <clears throat> a man concerned about entering the pastorate is to be very sure that he has the knowledge of the mystery that he's committed to this revelation and he's willing to put his life on the line for the truth of God or else you can't trust him you don't know what he'll do because in verse 3 in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, the genius 
of the mystery in Christ in you, the hope of glory, is just this marvelous and wonderful thing. And this is the new man, the new humanity, the believer's relationship to Christ. And who is he? He's God. He's more than man. He's God. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. He's the head of the body of which we are members and living cells. He's ascended, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, real, powerful, and coming again. Christian science teaches that God is a principle, not a person. A principle? How can you worship a principle? That's what they teach. Some years ago, before we had fishes of men, we had a few sample gatherings of men together. And a convert of E. Stanley Jones of India had come into the area by invitation, not from me, but from others. And arrangements were made to have him speak to our men. And uh, we were told that he was a D.L. Moody of India. And there was all that build up. And we had uh, uh, something to eat and we had this fellow speak from India. You know what he said about Christ? He said this, referring to his own testimony, that we seek to capture the essence of Jesus. Remember the scripture where Paul says, I'm afraid you'll have another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel. And this man traveled from east to west in the continent of America, speaking in fundamental orthodox baptistic churches. And they thought this was great to hear him. And his idea of Christianity was to try to capture the essence of Jesus. Not a person. An idea. If you glance down, you'll see what will happen if people are not grounded and do not have this marvelous experience in verse 4, quickly note, lest any man should beguile you. You see that? Lest any should beguile you in verse 8. Lest any man spoil you. Verse 8, lest any man spoil you. You see that? And in verse 16, let no one judge you we haven't time to look into those details now but I do want to stress these three things this, this is what will happen if there is a departure from the revelation of the mystery and it is not appropriated and appreciated and understood the knowledge that he speaks of here this is where it will go let no man beguile you trick you deceive you as did uh, the serpent uh, Eve our first mother how by persuasive words fancy talk religious talk highfalutin talk oh we have a philosophy we have an understanding we have a theology 
lest any should beguile you. That's why Paul says, I'm writing this because only the knowledge of the mystery and the revelation that lets us understand it is a wonder with many wonders within it. That's the only shield we have against those things. I'm not talking about cults. I'm talking about anything that comes along down the pike that claims to be a deeper insight. The other one in verse 8, lest any man spoil you. You know, that's the next thing that's happened. Literally become a prey. You get trapped. I've done a lot of trapping in my time. I regret the kind of trapping I did that destroyed the animal and caused the animal suffering. But I didn't do that very long. But on the farm, it's necessary to get rid of some animals. They don't belong there, and they can do a lot of damage. Have you any idea what a woodchuck uh, 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 can do to a whole garden of peas? He waits until they've gotten just the right height and the little blossoms come out, which would be the beginning of wonderful sweet peas. And then he's so lazy that he doesn't even raise his head or lower his head. He keeps at the same level and cuts the whole thing off like cutting a hedge. And you come out in the morning and you look at this. And so you decide, mm -hmm, I've got to get rid of a woodchuck. I have trapped animals in what they call, uh, uh, what is it, come alive traps or something like that. But once he's gone in, he can't get out. He doesn't like it, but he can't get out. He's in there. And this is the power of influence upon the mind. You don't have to be a psychologist to understand what the Apostle Paul is setting forth here. If you listen to the wrong people that will pull you away from the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, you'll be trapped. You'll be caught in a mindset. And you'll be thinking that way. And you'll be given a 35-inch yardstick. And from that point on, wherever you measure, you're going to be short of the truth. And you'll go right on feeling comfortable. You'll go right on feeling that, oh, I'm going by the Bible. But you'll be short all the way through because you're trapped in a mindset. I have talked with people like that. It has been a, a it's, it's a frightening thing. Intelligent people who began early in life to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And learned that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am a chief. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all the sin. And also probably heard the truth of the mystery. That we are crucified with Christ, raised up with him, seated with him in heavenly places. And then, listen to the wrong voice. And instead of being established and settled in the truth, go along with it. And they become trapped. They become prey. Sometimes even prey to a man. As you have it in verse 16. Let no man judge you. We can't go into the details of each of these three. But the judge... That's someone, someone you feel is passing an evaluation on how you live 
and will tell you what to drink and what to eat and that sort of thing as the Apostle Paul talks about because he's dealing with not only with Judaism <coughs> or Judaizers but with Gnosticism and, and other similar uh, oriental philosophies once you have become caught and in this mindset you're caught with an idea so that wherever you read in your Bible you've got a, a, a covenant theology or something like this seventh day advent people the same way wherever they read in the Bible it just supports the seventh day advent theory have you talked with something like this and they're reading the Bible but you see they didn't fall in love with the mystery to understand it and rejoice in it and they listened to the wrong voice read the wrong leaflet and they became caught and they got into a mindset which nothing but the power of almighty God can change and they become then servants of that theory or that philosophy or that interpretation or that theology and they become obedient servants to that it's frightening when I think of what is going on and how well-meaning people many elderly people have taken of their life savings and continued to support some of the uh, Bible colleges and seminaries today without realizing that they have, many of them, have abandoned the faith once delivered uh, to the saints. Some years ago, in fact, it must be 20 years ago or more, I wrote to a missionary because he had written to me and said how happy he was that one of his children, I don't remember now it was a boy or a girl, now finishing high school, was being accepted by Dash College. I knew what that school was. That's over 20 years ago. And I felt an obligation. You are over there in another country, in another culture, amongst other people, and for the most part you're dealing with, with babes and beginners. And you have no idea of what's going on in the, in, in the educational circles today. So I thought I would write him a nice little letter to draw his attention to this. That here he had been rejoicing that his child was going to go to a school that he had known in times past as reliable and good because he didn't know any better but I'm telling you it's very hard to get some people to realize the dangers that are going on and the dangers today are even greater than they were 20 years ago no question about it and here we've got boys and girls and young people young men and young women establishing Christian homes and if they don't know the Christ and who he is and get this now and what he is to the individual and rely simply on thinking and the exercise of the mind very easy to listen to the wrong voice persuasive talk Wait, don't you see how scriptural this is? Don't you see that we're quoting Bible? Why, we're pointing out things that people don't really know. And folks leave Bible-believing churches and go in support of something like this. 
Paul says, I wish you all knew with what agony of soul I see this going on. That was then. And he said, I, I'm concerned. You pass this letter to, to Laodicea. Let the other believers know of the dangers. So they won't listen to the wrong voices and think that someone with a higher academic degree or someone that claims that he has deeper insight into something, don't listen. You go by the book, you go by the book, you go by the book. And drive that home. And this is one of the, one of the ways we got our Bible, isn't it? When Paul's letters were shared by one assembly with another and that, and that sort of thing. And that's an interesting story in itself. But God wants us to know. He commanded us to know. And he told us, as for example in Romans 16, 25, that this is the way to be established. That their hearts might be established. Be encouraged in love. And you know, when people have the knowledge, they love to get together. And there is a love that is provided. And they are strengthened and encouraged and emboldened as we draw strength one from another. So you pray for your pastors and pray for one another that all might come to know the wonder that God had planned for so long and never had anybody share in it for so many thousands of years. But it's here now. It's here now. And let's pray that many of our new friends who are coming into the fellowship and are enjoying the Bible teaching, that if their eyes are not yet open to the grandeur of the mystery that their eyes will be open before the other verse the other voices can take over what a fellowship we can have what a joy divine leaning on the ever lasting arms they don't get arthritis they don't get tired they don't get weary. But what he employs is his word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this time that we can spend together. And now we pray that thou wilt prepare us for the Fishes of Men meeting. We pray that as the fellows get together, there will be liberty and freedom of expression and hearts may be opened unto thee that thou mightest pour out thy blessings upon that meeting on Tuesday. Now dismiss us with thy blessing. Use us, each one, for thy glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.